I think it really matters to think about animal welfare and, and human welfare and, and you know, uh, global health and environmental and all sorts of other issues all at the same time, all in the same conversation so that we really can think about the shared causes of these shared problems and identify solutions that will be um, co-beneficial for as many of these issues as possible. <laughs> Hello, I'm Katrina Volde. Welcome to Thinking Out Loud, conversations with leading philosophers from around the world on topics that concern us all. This video is part of a video series on ethical questions arising from the coronavirus pandemic. If you'd like to see more of my videos, please visit the Practical Ethics channel. COVID-19 is very likely a zoonotic disease, which means that it was transmitted from animals to humans. Other dangerous infectious diseases such as SARS, MERS, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, originated in animals too. In fact, of all emerging infectious diseases in humans, 75% are zoonotic. And though almost all of the focus now is on how to tackle the current pandemic, I want to learn more about what we can do to prevent future pandemics from arising. So I decided to make several videos on the topic animals and pandemics. In this video, I talked to Jeff Sebo, who's a clinical associate professor of environmental studies and an affiliated professor of bioethics, medical ethics and philosophy at New York University. OK, that's more than enough talking by me. Um, let's start with the interview. Thanks very much for taking the time um, to have this conversation. So I think or, or at least I hope that most people by now um, sort of realize that there is this link between viruses present in non-human animals and human pandemics. But what is it that we do that actually increases that risk of such a virus transferring to humans and that increases the risk of a new pandemic arising? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for, for uh, suggesting this conversation. I'm looking forward to it too. And this is a really important topic to be talking about right now. So to answer your question, there are very many things that humans do that increase the risk of epidemics and pandemics, various kinds of outbreaks. I think the main ones to focus on at a global scale might be industrial animal agriculture, the wildlife trade, and deforestation, and all of these are linked. So first, industrial animal agriculture, we currently breed and raise and then kill an estimated 100 plus billion farmed animals per year. And the vast majority of these animals live in industrialized settings, factory farms, where we breed the animals to have weakened immune systems. We crowd them together in, in cramped, toxic conditions. This is the ideal breeding ground for mutations and, and in general, uh, pathogens to, to spread in farmed animal populations, and then they spread to workers, and then they can spread uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Another is the wildlife trade. And, and this might be where COVID-19 originated. So, so humans will take wild animals from the wild and then sell them for food or, or clothing or medicine or entertainment uh, it, in many countries, both in the East and in the West. And then deforestation is, is also a main driver. In general, humans are chopping down lots and lots and lots and lots of trees for various activities, a, a, a leading one of which is, once again, industrial animal agriculture. Industrial animal agriculture is a leading driver of global deforestation. And when we cut down trees, all sorts of problematic things happen. One is that we once again put humans in close proximity with wild animals who might be carrying zoonotic diseases. Um, and another is we destroy biodiversity and ecosystems. And biodiversity, for various reasons, is part of what creates a buffer between humans and wild animals who carry zoonotic diseases. So we both get in closer proximity with them and destroy some of the buffers that keep those, those diseases from crossing over into humans. I mean, from what you're saying, it's clear that um, human, be human behavior has this massive impact on the likelihood of a new pandemic arising, yet this doesn't really seem to spur us into action somehow. And there was a, there's one thing that I find really puzzling. So in the, in the current pandemic, most people worldwide seem to think that social distancing is a really important measure to sort of tackle the current pandemic. And even I, like, I went to the shop, well, buy a, a takeaway coffee um, this morning and the, the person serving me ha was wearing her mask under her nose. And I was like, oh, oh no, this is like <laughs> scary. 
So we're worried about that. But then at the same time, most of us are quite indifferent to, like you said, all the, the billions of animals mm. that are crammed together in the factory farms, close to each other, close to humans, breeding grounds of pandemic. So I was just wondering, I mean, this seems completely inconsistent. Should we not include all these animals in the measures we develop yeah. too? I, I completely agree. Because we raise farmed animals at the scale of billions of animals in these dense facilities where there is no possibility of keeping them separate from each other, if a virus is introduced, it will spread across this population. And then what happens is the only option available to you, which is the option that people have been taking in the case of COVID-19, is to cull, which is a euphemistic way of saying killing the animals, because you have nothing else that you can do. At, when, when you house animals at this scale with so few resources and workers, there is no way to do testing, contact tracing, uh, quarantine, veterinary care. But if we were thinking about this holistically and structurally, we would consider human and non-human health together. And we would recognize that this is not a healthful and sustainable way to house non-human populations. And we would end these practices. You mentioned a holistic approach. I just wonder whether you could say a little bit more about that. Fa factory farming will harm animals and workers and public health and the environment. And it can be tempting to focus on only one or two of those impacts and then try to reduce those harmful impacts. But if you only focus on one or two of them, you might actually end up doing counterproductive stuff. So for example, if all you care about is climate change, then you might say, hey, we should reduce beef and dairy consumption and then replace it with chicken and fish consumption because chicken and fish consumption emits fewer greenhouse gases per meal than beef and dairy consumption do. In contrast, if you were thinking primarily in terms of animal welfare, you might make the opposite point because chicken and fish consumption will cause more animal suffering per meal than beef and dairy consumption do because the animals are smaller and so more of them are consumed uh, and have to suffer and die per meal. And so if you only focus on one set of impacts without focusing on the other ones, then there is a risk that you will identify solutions that might be, be a little bit better in one respect, but are actually worse in another respect and just trade one set of harms for another and never really identify or address the sort of like structural systemic root causes of these shared problems. And so I, I think it really matters to think about animal welfare and, and human welfare and, and you know, uh, global health and environmental and all sorts of other issues all at the same time, all in the same conversation, so that we really can think about the shared causes of these shared problems and identify solutions that will be um, co-beneficial for as many of these issues as possible. And, and that, in this case, will mean plant-based food production. That sounds wonderful, but that will require fundamental changes to the way we produce things, the way we live. And so it's a very ambitious approach, one could say. So doesn't yep. that make it potentially <laughs> counterproductive? People will just say like, geez, this is just too much. Like, we're not going to do this. It's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think people will have that reaction. And this is always the case when people advocate for radical changes to existing systems, right? This too, I think, is a situation where we need to think about it contextually and where we should resist either or thinking and embrace both and thinking because... While there might be exceptions and it all depends on the situation, I think it will usually be the case that we can make more progress together if we have some people advocating for radical structural change and then other people advocating for moderate incremental reforms within existing systems. And then the people advocating for radical change, they shift the center of the debate, they make the moderate changes easier to accomplish, appear more reasonable in comparison, and then the people can other people can achieve those moderate changes and make the radical changes appear less radical uh, be, because the goalposts have been shifted. So I, I think usually having a systems approach where different people are willing to do different things and, and some are more radical than others is usually the best way to deal with that issue. It would be bad if everyone was super alienating, but it would also be really bad if everyone bent over backwards to, to make their advocacy palatable because then we would just end up um, perpetuating the status quo indefinitely. And that would of course be really bad too. I was just wondering whether you could make it a little bit more concrete, like 
what is something that we could do to prevent pandemics in, that is in line with a holistic approach, like just some mm -hmm. concrete examples? Sure, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, these, these might also be very ambitious, but uh, for example, we currently heavily subsidize factory farming, which, which is part of what gives it the appearance of efficiency and affordability. So if we reduce those subsidies, uh, subsidies and increase subsidies for um, alternatives like plant-based or cultivated meat, then that would help. We can also better regulate it so that it adheres to higher ethical standards for treatment of animals or workers or health or the environment. Um, we can internalize externalities. We can basically make the industry pay for the health and environmental harms that it causes. So once you like reduce the subsidies, um, internalize those externalities, add some regulations, all of a sudden the prices start to increase and now plant-based products are subsidized. Those products are, are going lower. And, and that will really chip away at um, the economic advantages that this system currently has. There are many people, I'm sure, with really good intentions who want to adapt their, you know, what they consume so that um, they can at least help prevent uh, pandemics. Yeah, and, and like you said, it's really complicated. They might say like, okay, I'll, I'll eat beef instead because chickens are right. too dangerous for pandemics, but then beef is really bad for the climate. And then they mm -hmm. think, okay, I'll buy a vegan product. It turns out that that particular vegan product is really bad for local communities or for a forest right. somewhere. And then they just think like, whatever, I'll just go back to eating chickens. Yeah. <laughs> is yeah. there some concrete advice that you have um, for, for, for just ordinary people who want to do their best? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it really all depends on who you are and what your situation is. Uh, different people have different needs and, and opportunities. And, and of course, that should be taken into account. With that said, I do think that um, going vegan to the degree that you can is one of the best things that you can do because it really does limit, substantially limit the harms to animals, the harms to workers, the harms to global health, the harms to the environment, water, energy, land consumption, waste pollution, greenhouse gas emissions. This really is at the nexus of, of a lot of the, the worst harms human economic activity are causing. So to the degree that you can go plant-based or vegan, I, I think that would be a wonderful first step. And then you know, once, once you get the hang of that, you can, if you want to start to look more closely at the vegan products you consume and sift through them and figure out which ones further reduce harm. Um, one, one mistake that I think the vegan community sometimes makes is, you know, calling vegan diets or, or a vegan lifestyle cruelty-free or harm-free, because then that makes it seem as though it literally causes no harm and it sets you up for, well, what about the exploited farmers who pick your tomatoes. And of course, that is very, very bad. Um, and so I, I think the, the, the right way to frame this is that we should not be trying to eliminate the harm we cause because that is impossible. Being alive on this world necessarily means being complicit in some amount of harm. And, and so the challenge is not to eliminate the harm that we cause, but rather to minimize the unnecessary harm that we cause. And usually going vegan to the degree that you can is, is a really good first step for doing that through your consumer behavior. Thanks so much for- Of course, um, my, my pleasure. Illuminating conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much for suggesting it again and for doing the series. This is really wonderful. I really appreciate it. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe to the Practical Ethics channel and the Thinking Out Loud Facebook page.